right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a very sunny San Diego today. <laughs> and I am joined today by Doug Howard, who is just north of me, up just past LA in Santa Clarita. And Doug's, uh, welcome, Doug. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I love your of show. Of course, of course. Doug's life is a story of remarkable challenges and break, uh, groundbreaking discoveries from his fascination with uh, coordinate systems to a life-saving kidney transplant. His journey led him to uncover the concept of hypernomics, a field that explores uncharted dimensions in market analysis. And you founded uh, Hypereconomics Inc., developing in innovative software capable of analyzing markets in four or more dimensions, grabbing the attentions, attention of industry giants like NASA and Lockheed Martin. And you have a book coming out next month, Hypernomics Using Hidden Dimensions to Solve Unseen Problems, which will revolutionize conventional thinking. So um, just before we get into how you can have sales success with, with hyper, okay. hypernomics and getting into that, just give, give me a brief history of how you came up where you came to this concept well it's a pretty interesting story actually i um was out shopping with my wife of all things for a new washing machine and my wife said mm -hmm. as we walked up in front of this washing machine behind our local big box store she said you know i'd like to have more capacity a bigger drum than we have at home so i thought capacity versus price mm -hmm. I go, well, that's a 2D problem. And then she said, you know, the washing machine we have only has one delicate cycle. And I'd like to have some more of those. So I thought cycles versus mm -hmm. price. She just took this up to a 3D problem. And so uh, we both liked the machine we were looking at. And then I went up the next one up the line, same model, you know, same make, this a little bit bigger model. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, of course, it was more expensive. And uh, I said, what about this one? She says, it costs too much. We can't afford it. And then I realized that we were part of a global network that was setting the quantity that was going to be sold for this particular price. And we were going to be a little dot on a map. And so mm -hmm. this is part of the quantity price relationship. So that was another dimension she added. So she was looking at capacity, cycles, price and quantity she was working a 4d problem in her head mm -hmm. and so i raced home and started to work out a way to plot four dimensions which hadn't been done before and uh i figured out ways to do that and uh eventually we created some software around it and formed a whole company around it and um then proposed the book to wiley and wiley picked it up and it's coming out next month so Fantastic! No, it's a great, it's a, it's a great story. Uh, I mean, I guess there's a lot of us probably <laughs> doing that without knowing it, coming up with all these different dimensions uh, for when we make decisions or the way we look at the world, but we don't look at it in, we don't add them together and go, oh wow, that's that's a 4D problem. Well, at, you you make an excellent point there, John. It turns out the reason this works is that everybody collectively does this in a way that you can describe it mathematically. So there are certain limits that are formed by people's decisions. There's a certain upper boundary, how much they can afford relative to price. There's an outer boundary in a market with respect to how much they can will, will ever be able to buy relative to the saturation of a, mark, of a market. And then very often there's a minimum that means that people that are building the products in that market can only get by with a certain minimum amount of product mm -hmm. because they need to get their lines going. And then there's a certain bottom to the market that represents their certain threshold that they have, you know, relative to the price versus the cost. And so it works out that everybody's doing this all the time in every market outside of commodities in multiple mm -hmm. dimensions. And that's the reason we're able to portray it that way. Yeah, and uh, and and uh, we're going to talk about sales success with hypernomics and yes. revealing insights into the analysis of sales markets because today, I mean, there's a lot of analysis uh, when people do market analysis or market segmentation. It does it it does often it it's often quite simple, right? You know, a couple of dimensions mm -hmm. you look yeah. at because yeah. it just seems too hard to go too much deeper. Well, you know, that's the surprising things, John, is that what this does is it it, it sounds complicated at first blush. And I mm -hmm. got to tell you, somebody that discovered it, I didn't understand what it was 
when I first came up with it. But it turns out that it takes stuff that you already know and then turns it into something that you haven't seen before, but lets you see the market more deeply. So, for example, when we were looking at that washing machine problem, there's a certain amount of capacity that we're talking about mm -hmm. in cycles. And if you were to plot a map of all the capacity in the cycles, you'd see it's probably pretty evenly filled out, but there might be a gap in the market where somebody might have a, a washing machine that's you know in between the biggest size and the next biggest size, and it has a certain number of cycles that's in between the max and the min, and you could put something in that spot, and you would know that because people have bought products that are more expensive than that that have better features, and products that are less expensive than that that have fewer features, that somebody would buy that product. And so when you talk about how to use this in sales, what you do is you your client needs to look at their clients buying properties and then try to figure out something that they your that their clients want, don't have, and can afford. That's kind of a key phrase for us. What do your clients want, don't have, and can afford? These are three key elements to hypernomics. In fact, there's nothing more key than just that little phrase to the whole the whole discipline. So, from, so what you outlined there is it's a way also of, of obviously of finding a gap in the market and for mm -hmm. filling that gap. It's also a way, I guess, of disciplining yourself too, because if if your dimensions are out of whack, right? You know, if you if you're if you offer bigger capacity but your price is way too high. Uh, you have, and you're trying to aim at a mid market. You're you're out of whack. That's an excellent point, John. In fact, uh, I I wrote a um, a piece, actually December of 2020, in, in which I had discovered that this one aerospace company that was building a, a supersonic business jet mm -hmm. had worked out the right value for their product, which is to say that they worked out the right price. And it worked out, they had a cost model that probably was pretty accurate, but then they, they were trying to predict the demand for their vehicle. And it turned out that the demand was far beyond what we call the demand frontier for this market. So much so that it was, they only had about a 4% chance of making their target. So I wrote that it was worth every penny, this vehicle, but there weren't enough pennies in the world for this, this, this vehicle to be bought in the quantities that they needed. So I got an angry response back from one of their people and uh, he said, oh, I just got a big order in. Of course, he didn't tell me they were all for options, but yeah, we got this big order in and you're all wet. I said, well, that's great, but you're still not going to make it. And then six months later, the uh, product and the market and, and the company all collapsed. There was no more, more company because they couldn't find enough sales at that price. And uh, that was the whole thing. There was just simply not enough demand at that at, at that price point. So uh, so in that example there, obviously they did they didn't do enough research into the the audience, like the actual addressable sure. market, shall we say, here. Yes. Uh, and and I guess that's why companies sometimes bounce around over many years trying to figure out where they fit in the market because they haven't done or they haven't had a a uh, a process like you have in order to really market size property. Yes, and that's an excellent point, John, is that people haven't figured out a way to model this. And what we're giving them is a way to model this. This is something that the population at large has been doing for itself. And some people are really good at figuring out these, these market price points by themselves. So Elon Musk, I would say, for example, mm -hmm. with respect to Tesla, uh, he had the Tesla models out in, in mid-2010s, and they were doing pretty well. And then there was a big gap in the market and he figured out where to put new products into that market based on the market gaps. And of course, the Tesla Model 3 now is, is uh, one of the most popular vehicles in the world and precisely because he understood how to read the market. For the people that don't have that intuitive sense, you can just draw yourself a map and, and actually find out where you need to be in the market. And that's what this, this process helps you do. Mm -hmm. um what are some of the uh what, what are some of the successes you've had with this uh you have to name companies but just some examples of companies going through this process and what difference it made to to their position in the market well we we helped out uh virgin galactic i can't tell you exactly what we did but sure. you know we were working for a unit of sir richard branson's there and uh you know they were pretty happy with us we've worked for lockheed martin various divisions of them uh, 
most famously re recently, what we did was we took our model and applied it to the stock market. And only picking stocks from the S&P 500, we've managed to outperform the S&P 500 by about 2x hmm. over 44 months. And the chance of that happening due to chance is less than one in quadrillion quadrillion. So we've done really well with, in the areas in which we've attempted to apply it. And uh, we just we're looking to apply it more areas. And so we've hmm. got software now that lets people Drive out, drive out answers for themselves, and we're trying to get ourselves more widely known now. We've kind of been under the radar a little bit, as it would be, to to try to protect the IP. Yeah. But we have, that's the patent plaque I have over my shoulder there. So we have a patent now in place for this, and uh, and we think we're, we're in a pretty good position to go forward with this, and um, that people will understand this to be a, a groundbreaking discovery, one that... Uh, many people could use to their advantage mm -hmm. so so um what would you say to people out there in organizations maybe they're not like they're not virgin galactic they're not uh they're not uh you know big powerhouse they're saying like how, how could something like this ap apply to me what what is this what is the general application for this oh well that's an excellent question too thank you for that <laughs> um it, it turns out that it it applies to every industry outside of you know raw commodities that we've discovered so for example my wife and have wife and i have this little uh eatery in town here that we like to go to and, and during COVID, as most people know here in california the the restaurants had their indoor seating all closed off i'm sure it was the same for you down there in san mm -hmm, diego sure. and so we had to be outside and this this place that had a very big indoor seating arrangement, you know, thousands of square feet had a relatively small patio. And so all the patrons of this place would come in on a Friday and Saturday night and there was a line out the door. And I looked at the seating arrangements and I said to the manager, we knew her pretty well. I said, um, and we also knew the owner of the owner of the establishment I said, uh, Hey, Kayla, you want to make more money? She said, well, sure. Doug, what do I need to do? <laughs> I said, well, you've got a bunch of very large tables here. You've got tables of six. She had three tables of six out in this little area, and she had three tables of four and only a couple of tables of two. Now, I had known from observation that they, there were many more parties of one and two that came mm -hmm. through the restaurant. And then I eventually discovered through my research, this is after I told her this, that in the United States, there are over twice as many parties of two that go to restaurants as there are parties of four which mm. means you should have proportionally more seating sure. for two than for four. So I said, well, what you need to do is you need to take out some of these large tables and put in tables for, for two. Because she had these tables for you know four and six that mm. had one and two people at them. And she did that, and their revenue shot up 25% in two months. And so this is just a, a local restaurant that's you know employs a few dozen people over the course of a year, but it uh, it did tremendously well just by uh, you know taking some simple principles and applying it back to the restaurant. Yeah, what's what's really amazing about that about that story, Doug, is uh, it's something you know the research you said about you know how many people book or the number of people who book tables. But it's like that kind of research is out there. But you sometimes you even if you're in that industry and this is your 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 live and breed the restaurant business, you mm -hmm. may not have you may not have gone looking for that information, or you may not be calculating in that information. You may be just doing a spreadsheet exercise, which is, you know, number of people, number of you know selling this, and and you're missing out on those other dimensions. Yeah, the, the, we th we think the big advantage to hypernomics is that it lets you stand back and get a big picture mm -hmm. of things. And so what we we do typically is we we gather data about every industry in which we're studying, and we we might take in several dozen what they call independent variables or features of a product. Mm -hmm. So we might take in dozens of those, and then we might take in <coughs> excuse me dozens of observations, which in a restaurant would in the restaurant industry a bunch of restaurants or in the aviation industry, they might be a bunch of aircraft. And then you would plot these, these features and their prices and uh, figure out what it is that supports, what features support the price, and then what, what the price limit is for that market. And the, the, the thing is, is that the, the, the whole 
system of hypernomics is based on just four principles, which are product features, drive value, value limits price, price determines quantity sold, and quantity sold is a feature. So the whole system is circular, and it, it, it's in opposition with each other. So the value of the product is going to match mm -hmm. the demand of the product. The, the vertical axis, as we talk about this, is the price. And as you add features, the price goes up. But as you add price, the quantity sold goes down. So you have to balance these at all times. And it's, it's interesting to understand where markets have what we would call a really steep demand curve, which means there's more money towards the pricey end of the market. Mm -hmm. For example, in the United States, spy satellites and uh, military satellites and unmanned air vehicles are on a very steep curve. Right. And then you take something like business aircraft, it's on a relatively flat curve, which means that if you if you start to drop the price, you're going to make more revenue. And so mm -hmm. it's understanding the shape of these curves and their limits that becomes crucial to making the most amount of money you can in your business. Um, and the other thing, too, is, uh, is Doug, is that... Uh, is that what you just outlined there is that many people do pricing sort of based on what are my competitors charging and then i'll come in mm -hmm. at a sweet yeah. spot maybe just slightly under them or or whatever and there's there's little science behind it you even wonder if those companies that already established if there was much science behind their pricing to begin with yes that's that's something we've taken a real hard look at some some of these companies have underpriced their vehicles their products really badly and others have overpriced them so for example if Example of overpricing and, and overestimating demand would be the famous DeLorean that we saw back in Back yeah. to the Future. Yeah, I mean, you you having spent some time in Ireland, you probably mm -hmm. know a little bit about that. Yep. Um, it turned out that <clears throat> when DeLorean built this car, he priced it comparable to a you know the the top of the line sports models that were out mm -hmm. there at the time, but he had uh, about 130 horsepower in that, and, and comparable cars were you know, north of 200. And so by our accounting, the, he was pricing the car at $25,000, but according to the horsepower, it was only worth 15,000. Mm -hmm. And so a few people were taken in by the styling, which of course was great, but the, the horsepower was way down and that's a critical requirement for a sports car. <laughs> and so he didn't have the sales that he projected because he had over, he had overestimated the value of his vehicle. And um, therefore, he, he, he built a, a lot more than the market could absorb. He ended up holding a whole bunch in the bag and he went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. by, by contrast, there was a gentleman that uh, was the seventh employee of Microsoft that went down to Albuquerque and he decided he was going to build business jets and he was going to build them much like the way you build computers because he understood computers. Sure. And he said, well, how hard could it be to build a business jet? And he built this business jet and... According to our estimates, he was that jet was worth at least two point one million, maybe as much as two and a half million, and he priced it under eight hundred thousand dollars initially. Mm. Well, now, what would happen if you took your two million dollar house down there in San Diego and priced it at eight hundred thousand dollars? Well, you'd have all these these orders coming yeah, in, yeah, yeah. And, and you know everybody would be bidding there, trying to <laughs> bid into that thing, and you'd you'd have a big bidding war. Well, what happens in aerospace when you've got a product that's you know you effectively unlimited as long as you can keep producing them. He got all these orders in. I mean, basically more than the market had ever seen before for a, a product like this. And he couldn't keep up and he was selling them at a loss and he went bankrupt. So yeah. it, 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 uh, it, a lot of these people just don't take the time. I mean, these are billions that we're talking here. Mm, I mean, the yeah, yeah. lost several hundred million and, and this, this outfit in Albuquerque lost over a billion. That that uh, business jet that I was telling you about before that was up yeah. in uh, Reno lost a billion. I mean, this is you know you can you can get these analyses out for anywhere from a few tens of thousands of dollars to low hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when you're talking billions, yeah. Well, why aren't you spending the time to do that? You know. Yeah, it, it seems like that's not where right. you want to take the shortcuts. Is at the very beginning. Right. Um, yeah, no, I'm a De Delorean is is a funny one actually. When I just before I moved over to the states in the late '90s, one of the mm -hmm. people I worked with actually bought an old DeLorean. Mm. It was pretty beat up and needed a lot of work, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny. I don't think he held on to it for very long because, it, uh. I mean, you couldn't get parts or nothing like that. Oh yeah, right. 
But uh, but it is. But those are fantastic examples, Doug, because one where you you pitch the price way too high, the other one where you pitch it too low. And yeah, you know, you get all this excitement. But if you can't fulfill, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's as bad as being unable to fulfill is as bad as having stuff sitting in, you know, in the warehouse unsold. Exactly. Yeah, precisely. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been really interesting, Doug. Uh, all of Doug's information will be below this video. But before you go, please do tell people a little bit more about the work you do and confirm your book is coming out next month. Is that it? Yes, yes. Um, um, well, so the work we do is we, we, we basically offer three things now. We're going to be offering a fourth. The three things we offer is software, which we now call Hypernomica. And... Um, that software that allows you to plot in four dimensions and lets you figure out the value on one side and the demand on the other. Then we offer classes to train you on hypernomica and hypernomics in general. And then we offer consulting, as we said, to outfits like mm -hmm. Virgin Galactic, the restaurant down the street, NASA. And then my book is entitled again, uh, Hypernomics Using Hidden Dimensions to Solve Unseen Problems is coming out through Wiley. Oh, and it's uh, available for pre-order right now on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble and Wiley's own site. And it should be available on the bookstore shelves on January 29th. Oh, fantastic. Well, I would encourage you to go check out Doug's work. Go check out the book. Uh, this this could be this could be exactly what you're looking for in order to really understand the market you're in, understand your pricing, understand where you can play. Uh, and maybe you can retire the dartboard uh, that you yeah, use. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that phrase. That was great. I appreciate that. I don't have I have to use that again. I'll, I'll attribute it to you too. Oh, thank yeah, you. Don't worry about it. Listen, uh, thanks again, Doug, for today. Thank you for watching. All right, thank you so much, John. Appreciate it. See you all again soon.